Darren Nichols was arrested in May 1996 while in possession of 10 kilos of cannabis resin with a street value of £25,000. Four months earlier, Essex police had questioned another man about the Essex executions and had been told a very different story. Billy Jasper was arrested in January 1996 while connected in the East End criminal world and described as a big bruiser of a guy, Jasper was shaven headed and a fondness for crack cocaine and heroin. He was being guarded and not inclined to waste words. As the police began questioning him, Jasper changed tack and began talking about the Essex executions. Sullen and hostile, Jasper's monosyllabic replies and five word sentences began to build up an incredible story. He was telling police who murdered Tate, Tucker and Rolf. Confidently and hastily, Jasper constructed a detailed picture of the slaughter on December the 6th. Why Jasper, a man used to police interrogations, should suddenly decide to talk is hard to ascertain. His former criminal contacts speculated that he hoped for a deal, perhaps to secure the VIP treatment later enjoyed by Supergrass Darren Nichols. Whatever the motive, Jasper's statement was dynamite. Sometime in late 1995, Jasper said he'd met a well-known villain called Jesse Gale at Morton's Bar in Cannon Town. They were joined by a third man who over the years has gained the name Mr D. Shortly afterwards, the three men moved to a Mexican restaurant and began discussing the prospects of Tate, Tucker and Rolf. It is believed the two men accompanying Jasper were part of an East End cartel, the very same Cannon Town cartel who had negotiated with Pat Tate and Tony Tucker over the sale and distribution of a shortly expected consignment of cocaine. As previously reported, Tate and Tucker had no intention of paying for the drugs. They intended to steal the cocaine and had recently bought a submachine gun with this purpose in mind. Tate and Tucker had a long history of doing business in this fashion and this would be their biggest heist to date. The Cannon Town Cartel fought differently. They had found out that the Essex men intended to roll them and were planning what to do about it. Moreover, Underworld sources revealed that Gaird and Mr D had a personal score to settle. They had previously been involved in a drug deal which had been ripped off by Tate and Tucker and had lost out to the tune of £20,000. Believe me, says the source, losing that sort of money hurts. You're inclined to do something about it. According to Jasper's statement, Gail and Mr D talked about robbing Tate and Tucker, but Mr D insisted it would be better off to take them out of the game. He then asked Jasper if he wanted to earn five big ones, £5,000 to do a bit of driving. On the night of the murder, Jasper says he picked up a grey Fiat Uno Turbo from outside Peacock's gym in East London. He drove to a bar near Hornchurch where he picked up Mr D, who was carrying a sports bag. The bag seemed to have a dead weight in it. The two men drove to the windmill cab office at Upminster Bridge. Jesse Gale was standing outside. Taking the bag, Mr D got out and disappeared with Gale down the side of the building. Leaving Gale behind, Mr D reappeared still with the sports bag, directing Jasper to drive to Retterdon and was dropped off beside a lane. Jasper says Mr D told him he was going to pick up 4 kilograms of cocaine and that he returned about 40 minutes later, carrying the sports bag and a rucksack. Mr D then phoned Gail and told him everything was sorted. Jasper says the time was just past midnight. He says that when he saw the news of the murders the following day, he realised what had happened. He met Mr D at Morton's bar and followed him to the toilets to collect his money on the line of cocaine. I said to him, you fucking took them out of the game. Jasper says that Mr D grinned and told him not to ask questions. Jasper was called by the defence, but the judge ruled that much of his evidence was inadmissible. Today, Jasper stands by his story 100%. Jesse Gale is saying nothing. He died in a car crash in May 1998. Gale's former associates believe the crash was no accident. They say he was murdered by friends of Tate and Tucker. Extraordinarily, police paid little attention to Jasper's story and made no apparent attempt to follow it up. Yet his detailed account seems to fit much of the available evidence. 
Police put the death at around 7pm. This estimate is based entirely on when the three men stopped answering their mobiles and the evidence of Darren Nichols. Astoundingly, Paula Lannis, the police forensic pathologist, never made any of the normal scientific tests to ascertain the time of death. When asked in court why not, she said, it didn't seem important. However, three local witnesses gave statements to the police saying they heard shots between 10pm and midnight on December the 6th. Another witness said he walked his dog along Workhouse Lane that night at 7pm. It was positive the blue Range Rover was not there. A later time of death might also explain the Range Rover being in touch by the freezing weather when discovered early the following morning. Then there is the question of the footprint. The size 10 high-tech training shoe. Billy Jasper said on the night in question, Mr. D was wearing a blue tracksuit, surgical gloves and Reebok trainers. If the police are dismissive of Billy Jasper, the same cannot be said for those who inhabit the criminal underworlds of Essex and East London. Everybody spoke to confirmed Jasper's account to be accurate. Everybody spoke to about Billy Jasper are adamant that the Cannon Town Cartel were responsible for the murder of Tate's close friend John Marshall. The man has reported that Tate had entrusted £120,000 drug money and he was found shot in his car five months after the Essex executions. Police have always insisted there is no link between the two crimes but the case remains open and no one has ever been charged over Marshall's death. Jack Wimes was described as a model prisoner. Illiterate when arrested, he taught himself to read and write by following tapes and transcripts of Darren Nichols' evidence against him. He passed three sitting guild certificates and was chosen for Whitemore Achievement Award. The citation said he improved his life and lives of others through learning and noted his selfless willingness to help others. He was very well liked by staff and fellow inmates, said his prison tutor. Despite the guilty verdict, his former employees at G&O Haulage have remained loyal and his job was kept open for him. Darren Nichols described Jack Wilmes as the laughing assassin, a cold-blooded killer who calmly carried on blasting his victims as Steele's gun fell apart. Jack Wilmes, nicknamed the Angel of Death, according to trial reports, in March 1999, Jack Wilmes wrote to the Daily Mail asking for them to investigate his case. Apologising for misspellings, he told them to look into every detail of his past life. Then he said they would understand what they have done to him. Before his arrest, he said his life was his family and his work, both of which he loved. I have a lovely wife and two lovely kids. I have had a lot of wet pillows on my bed thinking about my family. And he comes back, what else is that? What's the second old all the time? It's like a crack of that thing. Oh, no, okay. Yeah. Do you remember what, what it was like, what colour? What did he say? He got back in the morning and took that stuff. 